I just want my kids. That's all I, that's my life for my kids. We, uh, we have a missing child. We can't list the neighborhood. I, I have no idea where he would be. Do you want them to hurt me, Becca? Why? So I don't ever see you again. There is a fundamental problem with the way children are treated in our country and honestly all around the world. Every child deserves to be with the person or people who will care for them, love them, and give them everything they need to thrive. I understand that the goal of our child welfare system is to have a child be with their biological family. However, so often that goal seems to take precedent over the safety and well-being of the very child the system is supposed to protect. To me, it doesn't matter if a child is with their biological parents if those biological parents are abusive and neglectful. If there's someone unrelated to the child who is willing to give them everything they need, then that is who should be caring for that child. But in today's case, as we see far too often, the parents' wants were put before the child's needs, and tragically, this mistake had the most devastating, tragic consequences. But before we get into the case, I want to say a huge thank you to today's sponsor, Hungry Root. Eating healthy can be a lot of work, but Hungry Root makes eating healthy so much easier. They send you fresh, high-quality groceries with simple recipes as well as essential supplements that can pull your whole diet together. All you do is take a short, fun quiz where Hungry Root will get to know your personal health goals, what you like to eat, and so much more. They will then build you a personalized chart with all of your grocery needs for the week, giving you delicious recipe recommendations to put those groceries to use. You can edit your weekly deliveries and choose exactly what you want to receive or let Hungry Root choose for you. Then when your delivery arrives on your doorstep, you can mix and match them with the groceries in your fridge or use the easy recipes they put together for you. Then the more you shop and cook with Hungry Root, the more the personalization engine learns what you like. The things I love about Hungry Root is that it takes the stress out of shopping and meal planning by giving simple, fast recipes. I love that I can discover new products and a variety of meals that fit my dietary preferences. I know that I'm someone who gets into a routine where I eat the same meals every day for multiple days until I get bored enough to look up new recipes, but then I still never really know what kind of recipe I want. In my Hungry Root box, I put that I'm a vegetarian, I like American and Italian foods, my goals are quick, easy recipes and discovering new meals, and I let them pick what they thought I would like, and I was very pleasantly surprised when I opened the box. So many delicious vegetarian options and new foods that I've never tried before. Before. They also gave me a few snacks to eat too because I love some snack food. Right now, Hungry Root is offering a special discount for my viewers. The first 100 people to use the link down below or scan the QR code and then use my code Rachel Shannon will get 40% off your first grocery order with Hungry Root. Again, use the link in the description box below or scan the QR code and use code Rachel Shannon for 40% off your first box. Thank you again so much to Hungry Root for partnering with me on today's video. Also, before we get in the video, I want to give a huge shout out to everybody that I got to meet in CrimeCon this year. It was such an amazing experience, one of the best weekends of my life. I can say that confidently. I learned so much from each and every one of you that stopped by to say hi. I'm so, so very grateful for everybody that I got to speak to. It was so much fun talking to you guys and getting to hang out with the other creators, learning so much from them and all of the other speakers that I had a chance to listen to. It was such a surreal experience and I cannot thank you all enough for making it such an amazing weekend. Next year, CrimeCon is going to be in Denver, so I really hope that I get to go to that one and I'm really looking forward to seeing all of you guys there. Again, thank you all so, so much for making all of this possible. Okay, with all of that being said, let's get into the case. Today is going to be a long one. It's going to be a wild ride. So just strap in and get ready for this one. And your friend was a graduate of the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign, later going on to attend Don Marshall Law School in Chicago, where he earned his law degree. From there, Andrew worked for years at various law firms. However, all throughout his life, Andrew was known to struggle with substance abuse issues. He was known to use alcohol and opioids to deal with his struggles. And once it got to the point where he was asked to leave one of his earlier jobs because the substance use issues were getting in the way of work. 
after losing that job, Andrew did seek treatment for his issues and went on to practice law out of his home for the 15 years that followed. But those who knew Andrew said that even after going and getting help for his addiction issues, he still struggled with substance use behind the shadows. Joanne Cunningham seemed to have a rough start in life, but by all accounts, things in her life did improve as her mom worked to get her life back on track. Joanne's father was in and out of prison and her mother had to take out an order of protection against him, but after Joanne's birth, her father was actually never involved in her life and according to her mother, she was able to provide Joanne with a happy life without her father in it. Then when Joanne was seven, her mother remarried and it was said that Joanne had a good relationship with her stepfather. Growing up, Joanne wanted to be an artist. She spent her time sketching and going to art camp over the summers. But when Joanne was 16 years old, she found herself pregnant by her boyfriend who was 21 years older than her. So clearly not the best situation going on here. She ended up dropping out of school and she moved in with her much older boyfriend. She gave birth to her son in 2000 and then went on to obtain her GED. By all accounts at this time, Joanne was known to be a good, involved mother who worked hard to provide for her son and improve herself. Her relationship with her then boyfriend lasted 10 years total. However, this relationship was reportedly not a healthy one. There were some issues of domestic violence. Her boyfriend was charged with domestic battery in 2003 when Joanne was 20 years old, but those charges were eventually dropped. By the time she was 23, she did end up breaking up with the father of her child. After that, she went on to cosmetology school and continued raising her son with the help of her mother and stepfather. By 2006, Joanne met a man named Craig Summercamp and the two started a relationship, eventually marrying in 2009. Around that same time, Joanne started taking prescription painkillers to treat her chronic back pain caused by fibromyalgia. That same year, Joanne filed for a foster parenting license so she could take in her godson who needed a good home. She was approved and the boy came and lived with her and Craig. By January of 2012, the marriage between Craig and Joanne fell apart when Craig filed for divorce. In those documents, Craig claimed that Joanne could become violent. When she got angry, there were times where she punched him in the face, threw hot coffee on him, and tried kicking him down a flight of stairs. It is thought by this time, Joanne's prescription pain use started to get very out of hand and she became dependent. Before the addiction, she was a decent person according to Craig. It was after she started the pills that something switched in her and the relationship went downhill fast. By the time she and Craig divorced, she was taking a mix of 12 to 15 painkillers, including Norco, Percocet, and Morphine, just to get through the day. Eventually, she was no longer able to get a doctor to prescribe them for her, so she eventually turned to the streets to buy them illegally. When Joanne first started appearing in court for the divorce proceedings, she was devastated. One day, she was in the hallway crying when she was approached by Andrew Friend, who was 25 years older than her. He talked to Joanne about what was going on, and she admitted that she was getting divorced and that she was heavily addicted to pain medications. This was something that Andrew could relate to. So, he actually offered to represent Joanne for free during the ongoing court proceedings. After filing for divorce, Craig moved out of the home he shared with Joanne, telling her she could live there until her son and foster son finished out the school year. At the time, she was requesting that Craig continue to financially support her, citing her fibromyalgia and the fact that she was raising two children. For the months that followed, Joanne's behaviors continued to escalate. She complained to the police, saying that she thought her home and cell phone were bugged. She started selling Craig's stuff in a garage sale against his wishes. She started yelling at neighbors and accusing them of calling CPS on her and of wanting to kill her. Joanne's mother, who helped her out with some finances and for things like groceries, said that her mental state was terrible. She was hallucinating, paranoid, and just going mad. Those around her encouraged her to go to rehab for her drug use, but she always just refused. Now, there was one neighbor who had in fact called CPS, so she was getting bi-weekly visits at the time. Her caseworker noted that she was struggling with her circumstances, but reported no concerns regarding the safety or well-being of her children. 
By August of 2012, it was time for Joanne to move out of Craig's home. She had nowhere to go and had been developing a relationship with Andrew, so that same month, Joanne moved in with Andrew. Once she left the home, Craig reported to the courts that Joanne caused upwards of $20,000 worth of damage before she left. There had been kitchen appliance fires, the house was covered in dog feces and urine, and there were mold and insect infestations all around the home. At this time, after moving in with Andrew and leaving behind that disgusting mess of a house and failing to uphold her duties as a foster parent, the seven-year-old foster son was removed from her care. She also voluntarily surrendered her foster care license. The trial for divorce from Craig started in October of 2012. At that time, she was found guilty of indirect criminal contempt for selling Craig's belongings. That was a direct violation of her court order. For this, she received a 14-day jail sentence with the judge citing that he didn't think Joanne would follow through on any lesser punishment. After that, the divorce was finalized, citing that Joanne had caused physical harm to Craig during their marriage. The judge also decided that he would not have to financially support Joanne, saying that she was unemployed for no stated credible reason. At that time, when Joanne went to serve her time, her now 12-year-old son went off to live with Joanne's mother. After Joanne got out of jail, her addiction continued to worsen. She was now turning to heroin after meeting a woman in prison who gave her a connection to get it. Now, while living with Andrew, things were chaotic. Andrew had another roommate at that time who watched as the two argued and fought. Joanne threatened to kill herself multiple times. She would have the police call on her numerous times. She would have the police called on her numerous times. She would hang out with these drug-addicted teenagers who would come by at all hours of the night. Andrew did start to get tired of all of this, and at times, he would kick Joanne out but then she would just come back the next day and it would be forgotten about. Police were called for multiple domestic disturbances where it was claimed that Joanne would hit or throw things at Andrew. In another incident, this time Andrew was caught beating Joanne. When the roommate tried to intervene, Andrew pushed him down the stairs. After this, the roommate did ultimately move out of the home because it was just too chaotic for him. During all of this, Joanne was trying to fight her mother to get her 12-year-old son back and living with her. However, Joanne's mother knew that he needed to be protected. The house was in squalor. It was a disgusting, filthy mess. There were constant domestic violence issues, and the son didn't want to go home either. He knew that his mom had some really severe issues and didn't want to be around to deal with them. In the end, Joanne's first son was ordered to stay with his grandmother, who raised him for the years that followed. When this decision was made, Joanne was absolutely devastated. She wanted her kid back no matter how bad her living conditions were or mental health was. She didn't want what was best for her son. She just wanted him in her care. But thankfully, he stayed with his grandmother and by all accounts, he flourished in high school, played sports, and is a well-adjusted kid. He is an adult now who, again, by all accounts, continues to do well. That same year in 2012, Andrew actually suffered a stroke and was no longer able to practice law temporarily. After the stroke, he also didn't do anything to try and maintain his law license. He failed to keep up with the requirements and eventually his license was suspended. He then got a job doing manual labor for a friend, but he actually suffered a severe injury to his hand and was no longer able to do that job either. After that, he started receiving disability checks, which is what the couple were living on for the months that followed. I also want to note that all throughout all of this, both Andrew and Joanne were on drugs. Their close friends and family members watched as they turned into monsters. After starting using, they lacked empathy. They were angry and fighting all of the time. They were abusing each other physically and verbally, living in squalor. They actually also had cats locked in the basement who peed and pooped everywhere, and they just left it and left the cats down there to suffer until eventually the roommate came back and let the cats out. Then, to add to everything that was going on in their lives, in early 2013, 30-year-old Joanne found herself pregnant with a baby boy. By October 14th, 2013, Andrew, or AJ Friend, was born via C-section in Crystal Lake, Illinois. 
When he was born, he was struggling from the moment he took his first breath. He had tremors, was sneezing, crying excessively, and had an overreactive startle reflex. To doctors, he showed clear signs of drug withdrawal, so they went ahead and tested the blood in his umbilical cord, and sure enough, it tested positive for traces of heroin as well as opioids. Joanne's mother was present for his birth, and after seeing his condition, she took the doctors aside and told them that they can't let Joanne take AJ home. She expressed concerns about both Joanne and Andrew, saying that neither were fit to raise him. Joanne even admitted at one time that she was on heroin during the first trimester, but after learning she was pregnant, she stopped, but eventually it seemed that she switched to opioids. After his birth, AJ remained in the hospital for almost a month as he was treated for his condition and given the proper nutrition to ensure growth. He was discharged by November 12th, and at this time, DCFS placed him into the care of a cousin of Joanne's who stepped up to the plate to raise this little boy. After the cousin took AJ, he thrived. He grew into a healthy baby boy who was being well cared for by his alert, attentive foster mother. AJ was known as a fun-loving, energetic little boy who had a big smile and a big personality to match. He was intelligent and social, making friends easily at school. He was loving, affectionate, and outgoing. AJ loved drawing, having books read to him, and playing with his Thomas the Train. He was fascinated with fire trucks, bulldozers, cement mixers, and he loved watching Ninja Turtles. He was curious and wanted to learn about everything. He also loved doing puzzles and made sure to take a picture of them after he was done to show off his achievement. With his foster mom, he was enrolled in gymnastics and went to a library program twice a week. He went to regular doctor's visits, which always came back as clean and healthy. He was starting to reach his milestones at appropriate ages and was living his best life. While AJ was living with his foster mom and thriving, Joanne went right back to her old habits. Five weeks after giving birth, she overdosed on heroin and was back in the hospital for that. At the time, Andrew also admitted that he was using alcohol, cocaine, and opioids right after AJ's delivery. A witness reported that the condition of the home they lived in was just getting worse and worse. The house was filled with trash everywhere. There were more animal feces all over. There was black mold everywhere, which is extremely dangerous to be living with. Within the first few months of his life, AJ's parents did try to see him, but they didn't try to gain custody of him until early 2014. In January of that year, Joanne sat down with a caseworker with DCFS and talked about her struggles. She said that yes, she had problems with drugs, but she didn't have any sort of mental health issues that would get in the way of her caring for AJ. She said she was loving and was able to provide the love and care her baby needed. She said that she's well aware that she has a disease, which is her addiction, but she was taking the steps to become sober. She loves having her kids around and wanted to raise them in a safe, happy home. She said that she would do whatever it took to get AJ back. So she agreed to do drug treatments, counseling, random drug testing, and parenting classes. This was the start of the process for working with DCFS to get AJ back. The goal was that within a year, AJ would be reunified with his biological family, given that they could provide him a happy, safe home. After that started, a judge ordered that Andrew and Joanne could see AJ once a week under supervision. During those visits, a caseworker reported that they were loving and appropriate towards AJ. Then, both Andrew and Joanne completed an intensive outpatient drug treatment program. After that, they went to ongoing individual and group counseling sessions, and by spring of 2014, it appeared that Joanne and Andrew were making great strides, but of course, they did run into some issues. While going to group sessions, they met another couple who were in need of a home, so they rented out their basement to them. This was against the advice of their caseworker, who told them that they were not allowed to have roommates. However, they moved in anyways, but after they moved in, the couple said that it was a horrible, terrifying experience. They were originally told that the basement was a fully furnished basement room in a sober living home. But when they got there, they realized that it was just a dark, moldy basement with a disgusting old mattress that looked like it had been taken out of a dumpster. 
There was no bathroom, no kitchen in there as promised. The ceiling was falling down and there was so much stuff in there that it looked like a hoarding situation. DCFS, of course, found out about the roommate situation, but nothing was done about it. By July of that year, Joanne found herself pregnant once again. At that time, they were now requesting unsupervised visits of AJ, but that was denied, citing that AJ, who is now one year old, was happy and healthy in his current home. But by November of 2014, a judge did grant unsupervised visits, but denied the request for overnight visits. By December 30th, 2014, Joanne gave birth to her third child, a baby boy who was born without drugs in his system, so Joanne and Andrew were allowed to take him home. Months passed, and the visits with AJ while having their new baby at the home were going well. Each time AJ would do these unsupervised visits, a family member would make sure to drop by the home to make sure he was being well cared for. Both Joanne and Andrew stayed sober during this time, and although family members reported ongoing concerns for their ability to stay sober, things were looking up. By April of 2015, Joanne and Andrew were approved for overnight visits. By this time, family and caseworkers saw that Joanne and Andrew were putting in the work. They weren't perfect, but they loved AJ and their other son, and they wanted to have AJ back. Meanwhile, his foster mom was starting to have to face the reality that AJ was going to be taken away from her. He was going to be placed with his parents again, and she wasn't ready for that. She loved AJ so much and wanted to make sure he was safe and happy. So she requested that she be allowed to continue visiting AJ after he returned back to his parents. Finally, by June of 2015, a judge ruled that 20-month-old AJ can start living with his parents and his baby brother. However, with this arrangement, DCFS did still maintain custody of AJ. They would continue sending state workers to monitor his progress, making home visits twice per month. After getting AJ back, the financial situation for the family started to improve as well. They were able to raise some money for local resources to get some of their debt paid back. Then, Andrew went in front of the bar panel and opened up about his struggles. He admitted his addictions and how they affected his life and his ability to practice law. But he said that he is working so hard to improve himself for his family. He's doing everything in his power to become a responsible caregiver to his two sons and a good partner to Joanne. He pledged to continue working to improve himself so he could provide for his family and be a good role model for his two young boys. By January of 2016, Andrew was allowed to go back to practicing law on a probationary basis with the stipulation that he remain sober and continue treatment. For the months that followed, things seemed to be going really well. Random drug screenings proved that they were sober for a year and a half. They enrolled the boys in a kinder care program four days a week while Andrew continued working and they both attended their counseling. They allowed AJ's older foster mom to watch him on the weekends when they were out. They brought the boys to their grandmother's house to visit with her and his older brother. Now, while in treatment for their sobriety, both Andrew and Joanne were taking Suboxone to help control their cravings and to keep them off heroin. There was one time in which Andrew tested to have taken more than his prescribed dose, so AJ was taken away temporarily while DCFS investigated this. They wanted to make sure that Andrew was still following the guidelines and not taking the drug in an amount that would impair his mental ability or his capacity to take care of AJ. However, in the investigation, they spoke with Andrew's psychiatrist, who said that even if he did take an extra dose of Suboxone, it won't cause a high. It just stops the effect of withdrawal from heroin, so this extra Suboxone in his system was not an issue. The doctor said that it's actually recommended that people coming off heroin take Suboxone basically as long as they need it, with some patients taking it for several years to prevent relapse. After all, taking this medication is definitely better than going back to heroin. After this, AJ was returned back to their care. By April 21st, 2016, AJ's case with the state was closed, citing that Andrew and Joanne had been sober since December of 2013, two and a half years. The state found that it was no longer in AJ's best interest to be in the care of the state, 
so they relinquished custody back to his parents and closed the case altogether. According to family members, for the months after custody was given to Andrew and Joanne, things were going well. Even with DCFS no longer checking up on them, it appeared that they remained competent parents. But by late summer going into early fall in 2017, almost two years after AJ returned home, signs of trouble started to emerge. On Halloween of 2017, one neighbor said that AJ went to her house to trick-or-treat. She saw that he was wrapped in a substantial amount of medical tape all over his head and torso, so naturally, she thought that AJ was a mummy for Halloween. But when she said this to Joanne, Joanne actually told the neighbor that his medical tape wasn't a costume. AJ had spilled boiling water all over himself and the bandages were there to treat the burns. Joanne assured the neighbor that AJ went to the hospital for the injuries. However, later review of the case showed that there was no hospital visit. Then, Joanne let her cosmetology license expire, meaning that she could no longer work. After that, in the fall, they did not enroll AJ in school. Joanne and Andrew cut off contact from the rest of the family members, refusing to return their calls or let family see AJ or his little brother. Then, more financial hardships started to sneak back in, so Andrew and Joanne started taking in roommates again, some of which were from their drug addiction counseling groups, so they were letting people into their homes with criminal records, not knowing much about them. And as you can expect, it appears that both Andrew and Joanne slipped right back into drug use. One day in March, Joanne was found sleeping in her car in North Lake, about 40 miles away from their home. When officers found her, she was crying, saying that she had no idea how she got there. She claimed that she had gone to a friend's house the prior night, and someone must have slipped something into her drink, causing her to black out. She was then taken to the hospital for treatment, where Andrew, AJ, and their youngest son met up with her. While there, hospital staff called the DCFS hotline to report that AJ had odd bruising on his face. Both the boys appeared very dirty, and their clothes were on inside out. The children didn't seem very happy and they appeared to be very guarded. The hospital staff also noted that Joanne had very recent track marks all over her arms, feet, and neck, indicating that she had recently used. Of course, the story of someone apparently slipping something into her drink seemed to be untrue. At that time, she also refused to take a drug test. The same day that the DCFS report was made, a worker, Kathleen Gold, tried to locate AJ. She first went to a house that she believed he lived in, but it was the wrong address. Then she went to the correct house, but nobody was home. She tried to call over the next few days, but no one was returning her calls. It actually took a month for this caseworker to actually see AJ. She spotted him at the home playing outside with his brother. In her report after seeing the kids, Kathleen reported that the kids were lucid and stable. They were well cared for, appropriately dressed, and clean. By then, she spotted no bruises on AJ, but of course, this is a problem because she should have spotted him the same day that the report was made. A month later, of course, those bruises are going to be healed. By May 17th, 2018, Kathleen finally went to the home and went inside, setting up an appointment to meet with Joanne and Andrew. In that meeting, Joanne admitted to Kathleen that she had relapsed after more than four years of sobriety. She then underwent a five-day detox program and started treatment on methadone. She was continuing counseling and doing random drug screenings. At the time, the house appeared well-kept and there was no sign of mistreatment to either boys, according to the report. Kathleen's report went on to say that Andrew was a very protective father who wouldn't let anything happen to the boys. He was practicing law out of his home and did care for the boys when Joanne was out relapsing. Kathleen determined that the allegations of abuse were unfounded, However, the records show no indication that Kathleen ever asked Joanne or Andrew or either of the boys about the bruises to AJ's face. After this check-in, Joanne's behaviors continued to go downhill. She was admitted to the hospital for suicidal thoughts after saying that she wanted to walk in front of a bus to kill herself. At the hospital, she was charged with battery after allegedly scratching a nurse who was treating her. At that time, she was showing signs of opioid withdrawal. 
she admitted that after her relapse, she started using again daily, doing 10 to 15 bags of heroin total, costing her about $100 per day. Another neighbor reports calling DCFS three times in 2018. One time, she noticed that AJ had two black eyes, as well as bruising to other parts of his face, neck, and both arms. When the neighbor asked Joanne about this the first time, she said that AJ had fallen down the stairs. About three weeks after that, the same neighbor noticed more cuts and bruises on AJ. This time, Joanne said that AJ went into the basement and tried using power tools, but hurt himself while doing so. The third time, the neighbor noticed more bruises to his face, but Joanne didn't give an explanation for this. Another neighbor called the police to report that they noticed the home had been dark for several weeks, saying that they were worried that there was no electricity in the home. Officers responded to the call to see that the outside of the home was in disarray. The grass was overgrown, the paint was chipping from the house, and Joanne admitted that the power had been turned off and she was trying to get it back on. The officer did not step foot inside the home at that time, but he said that he saw AJ and his brother and they both appeared healthy. A report was made with DCFS regarding the utilities being shut off, but no further action was taken. After this, in the months that followed, neighbors continued to report things that were going on around the house. They would see Joanne and Andrew screaming at each other and having intense, heated arguments. They saw one time that their younger son was inside a parked car with only a diaper on while the parents fought inside. As the neighbors were making those DCFS calls, Joanne would come out and yell at her neighbors, asking them to stop calling. She told one neighbor that she had no electricity and no food for her kids, that things were hard enough already without them calling DCFS. Neighbors would often offer to help, but she never accepted the help. By December 18th, Joanne went to a nearby Taco Bell, telling an employee to call 911, saying that her roommate had stolen her phone and prescription medications. This was a roommate that they had met through their drug counseling, who was sort of there on and off. He too struggled with his mental health, so he would leave to get help and then come back. Police responded to the call and located the roommate, who did not have any of Joanne's property. At that time, police actually found out that Joanne was driving on a suspended license, so she was arrested for that. Because of this, officers made a visit to the home, which they described as cluttered, dirty, and in disrepair. There were clothes, boxes, and trash bags everywhere. The children's rooms smelled strongly of dog feces and urine. They also noted a large bruise on AJ's right hip. Police called DCFS to report these findings, saying that Joanne is a recovering heroin addict who does not look good. She isn't clean and probably hasn't been in a long time. Officers took temporary custody of the boys and took photos of the home and of AJ's bruises. With this report, the DCFS caseworker Carlos Acosta followed up. With his mom present, Carlos asked AJ how he got the bruise. Joanna said for AJ, you got it from the dog, right? And AJ said yes. Carlos agreed to let Joanne take AJ back as long as she took him to the hospital immediately, which she did. At the ER, the doctor was unable to determine the exact cause of the bruise. She said that it could be the result of a dog, belt, or even a football. When the doctor took AJ into a room and interviewed him alone, AJ reluctantly admitted that maybe someone did hit him with a belt. He said, maybe mommy didn't mean to hurt me. The doctor informed the caseworker of this, but no further investigation was done and Carlos allowed AJ to go back home given that Andrew would be present when picking him up and would stay at home with him. The following day, Carlos followed up at the home and interviewed Andrew. Andrew assured him that Joanne does not abuse the kids, only occasionally spanking them with an open hand. Carlos then looked into the previous case taken out against Joanne, where Kathleen wrote that the abuse allegations were unfounded. So, by January of 2019, he too determined that the abuse allegations were unfounded. It was also put in the report that the reports of the home being in bad conditions were also unfounded. By now, you know that all of this information is incredibly concerning. Clearly, Joanne was continuing to use drugs despite being sober for years and doing her counseling. Their house was disgusting, filled with mold, trash, and dog feces and urine. 
Both her and Andrew were showing increasingly erratic behaviors, making those around them concerned for AJ and his little brother's well-being. AJ had bruises on his face and body and even told a doctor that he was being hit by his mother. But still, his caseworkers deemed the reports of abuse unfounded. All of these red flags being ignored resulted in the most horrific, heartbreaking end for little AJ. By around 8 a.m. on April 18th, 2019, Andrew called 911 to report that they have a missing child. He spoke in a very calm, collected manner, saying that he went to check on his son that morning and he wasn't there. He last saw his son at around 9.30 p.m. the prior night when he went to bed. He said that they've canvassed the neighborhood, went to a local park and a local gas station where they normally buy treats to see if he was there. He spoke with school staff, but no one has seen him and he has no idea where he could have possibly gone. 911, what's your address of your emergency? At 94 Dole Avenue, Crystal Lake, Illinois. Okay, tell me exactly what happened. Um, we, uh... We have a missing child. Um, woke up this morning and uh, he wasn't. He wasn't. How old is uh, the child? The yeah, missing child. Yeah, how old is he? He's five. And when was the last time you seen him? Uh, last night, uh, probably 9:30. Uh, when he went to bed. Okay. Are you the father? Yes. Do you know where he might have went? No, um, we can't with the neighborhood. Yeah, I went to the local park, um, the, the, the local gas station down here where we sometimes take them to buy treats. Um, I spoke with the assistant principal over there at the school where the park is, and they, they haven't seen uh, Kim or any other child. I, I have no idea where he would be. Okay. So you put him to bed last night, so he was in his pajamas, and then... When you tried yeah. to get him for school, he wasn't there, and then you left around for a bit? Yes. What time was he supposed to be at school? Well, he didn't go to school, but I had a doctor's appointment this morning. When I got back from the doctor's appointment, um, and I checked in on him, said good morning, and he wasn't there. So that would have been what time was that? about between 8.15 and 8.30. And have you checked everywhere, like under tables or? In closets? Closets, the basement, the garage, everywhere. What's your child's name? Uh, Andrew, last name Trend. We call him AJ. And Trend is T-R-E-N-D? F-R-E-U-N-D. Yeah. 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 yeah, we've been through the house, like, completely. Yeah. Let me know when the officer's at your uh, door. Uh, he's here right now. Okay, I'll let you go. Okay, thank you. Okay. After the call, police responded, immediately deploying a massive search effort. They looked all around the neighborhood, spoke to family members and any neighbors who could have seen or heard anything. Joanne's mother asked police if they were on drugs when AJ left, saying that he might have gotten scared and ran off. Maybe he hid under a bush or tree and got stuck there. By the following day, however, it was clear that the police officers were not focused on the surrounding areas anymore. They brought sniffer dogs into the home, which again was described as having disgusting hoarder-like conditions full of mouse and dog poop and dirt and filth. When officers went into the basement, there was so much trash that they had to move it out of the way to make a walking path for them. When they moved the trash, they saw cockroaches all over the floors. When they made it to AJ's room, they found a sliding chain lock on the outside of the door, meaning that AJ could be locked in from the outside. Inside, they found mouse droppings all over the room and found that AJ's windows had been bolted shut. The sniffer dogs indicated that AJ had actually never left that home on foot. There was no scent of him anywhere outside around the home, which would be expected if he left the home by walking away and hiding somewhere. So he was either picked up and taken out of the home or he never left that home. At first, Joanne and Andrew were very cooperative with police. They went along with the police to aid with searches. They hung up posters and held a vigil to get the word spread about the disappearance. 
Even though they had problems with drug use and weren't the best parent, no one who knew Joanne or Andrew thought that they would ever harm their son. Joanne took to the media, appearing on Good Morning America with a desperate plea, asking for her son's safe return. She said that her boys are her life. She is nothing without them. Andrew also did a news interview outside of the home, begging AJ to come home. I just want my kids. That's all I That's my life. They're my kids. Can you just tell us, do you have any idea where your son is? Or do you have any guess where he might be? I have no idea. Can you tell us how this is? How are you dealing with all this? Please come home. Please come home. I'm sorry. Obviously, you're cooperating with the police, trying Absolutely. to do everything you can. Or can, what would you say about your efforts to find your son? We're, we're just extremely worried. If anybody knows anything about where Andrew Jr. is, please, please contact the Crystal Lake Police Department. Let's get him home. Okay. And sir, if he's watching right now, what would you want him to do? If you just happened, if someone please would... come home. However, it turned out that both Andrew and Joanne knew exactly what happened to AJ. They were the ones responsible for his disappearance. And what police would discover in the weeks after this missing persons report is absolutely horrendous. By April 24th, 2019, six days after he was reported missing, the body of five-year-old little AJ Friend was discovered. He was found in Woodstock, about seven miles away from his home in Crystal Lake, Illinois. He was found buried in a shallow grave with his body wrapped in a plastic bag. Turns out, during the investigation and searches for AJ, police confiscated Joanne's and Andrew's cell phones, and what they found on the cell phones told them everything they needed to know. They found a video recording taken of AJ on March 4th, a month before he went missing. The recording was two minutes long and later deleted, but they were obviously able to recover it. The recording showed AJ lying on a mattress in a crib in his room. He appears to be naked, except that he has some bandages around his wrists and hips. There is an ice pack on AJ's face, which he removes to reveal that AJ had two black eyes, as well as bruising to his upper chest and neck. Then, they heard the sound of Joanne's voice in that video berating AJ for peeing the bed. They think that this video was taken and shown to Andrew as a way of Joanne to show him how bad AJ was behaving. There were multiple other images on that phone that showed AJ with bruises to his face, torso, neck, and arms. There's other videos where Joanne is berating AJ for apparently lying to her. In one video, she grabs AJ and pushes him against the wall by his throat and chokes him. In that video, she is questioning AJ if he loves his family. He said yes, but she doesn't believe him. In another video, AJ says that he doesn't want a family. To this, Joanne responds that this is why he's in his room all day. She then screams at him, saying that he doesn't have a family, daddy included. She said, you really think daddy would choose you over me and your little brother? She then calls AJ a liar and manipulator. She then puts her mouth to his ears and screams in his ears. But why do you want them to hurt me, Parker? Why? In addition to the videos of abuse found on Joanne's phone, on Andrew's phone, police found that at around 3 a.m. on April 15, 2019, 
a Google search was made for child CPR. It was after they were confronted with this video and that Google search that Joanne and Andrew were backed into a corner. It was clear that they were horrifically abusing AJ and police knew based on these videos that they were responsible for his disappearance. At that time, Joanne and Andrew directed officers to the location of AJ's body. After leading investigators to AJ's body, both Joanne and Andrew were arrested and charged with first-degree murder, aggravated battery, aggravated domestic battery, and failure to report a missing child or death, among other charges. After this, Andrew sat down with officers and spoke about what really happened to AJ in his final hours. He told officers that on the evening of April 15th, 2019, AJ was in trouble because he hid a pair of underwear that he had soiled. Which just as a side note, the fact that AJ was peeing the bed is a red flag that he was being abused. A lot of times when children are being abused, especially sexually, they will start peeing the bed even after they're potty trained. But either way, AJ had apparently hidden a pair of underwear that he had soiled, probably because he didn't want to get in trouble, but AJ found it and began hitting AJ before placing him into a cold shower as punishment. When asked about this, Andrew said that Joanne would often hit AJ so severely that he had to step in and stop her. That night in particular, he said that to prevent Joanne from hitting AJ more, he suggested a cold shower as a punishment instead. That is how he ended up in that cold water, but with the cold shower, Joanne questioned AJ about the soiled underwear, and every time AJ tried saying anything, according to Andrew, Joanne would put the shower nozzle right up to his face and spray him into the face until she was satisfied that he was telling the truth. The shower lasted about 20 minutes before Andrew eventually took him out. He then put him to bed still naked and wet. After that, he went to sleep. But then by around 3 a.m., now going into April 16th, Joanne woke Andrew up to tell him that AJ was not responding. So that is when he made that Google search for CPR. After realizing that AJ was dead, Andrew told Joanne that he would handle it. He then placed AJ's body into a large plastic bag in the basement. By April 17th, he then took AJ's body and drove out to a rural area in Woodstock where he dug a grave and buried his body. After finding the body, AJ was sent off to the medical examiner for an autopsy. The medical examiner found numerous blunt force injuries to his head, torso, and extremities. They found severe swelling of the soft tissue surrounding AJ's head, severe brain swelling, multiple abrasions and contusions on all four extremities. They found blood inhaled in his lungs. Then on his forehead, they found multiple small circular abrasions, which are consistent with the head of the shower nozzle used in his punishment. So no, Joanne was not just spraying him in the face as he was trying to give his mom answers as if that's not bad enough. She was beating him in the head with the shower head. The medical examiner determined that AJ's cause of death was craniocerebral head trauma due to multiple blunt force injuries to his head consistent with child abuse. His manner of death was determined to be murder. Of course, based on everything we know up to this point, it's clear that both Andrew and Joanne were horrifically abusing AJ until that fateful night when Joanne took it way too far. It was only after she beat him so hard with such brutal force that his brain bled and swelled that she was satisfied with her punishment. She then put him to bed, acting surprised that he died from his horrific injuries. They tried bringing him back to life, but his little body could not take it any longer. So after finding that they had beaten their son to death, Andrew decided that the best course of action would be to hide his body, drive seven miles away from the home, and bury him in hopes that nobody will find him. Then they report him missing, hoping that they could convince police that maybe he was kidnapped. Maybe someone else took him and murdered him. But them inflicting the abuse wasn't enough. Joanne had to record it, which led them to discovering what really happened happened. After all of this, 36-year-old Joanne Cunningham was charged with five counts of first-degree murder, four counts of aggravated battery, two counts of aggravated domestic battery, and one count of failure to report a missing child or death. Meanwhile, Andrew was charged with five counts of first-degree murder, two counts of aggravated battery, one count of aggravated domestic battery, two counts of concealment of a homicidal death, and one count of failure to report a missing child or death. 
At the time of her arrest, Joanne was actually seven months pregnant. She gave birth to her fourth child in jail. Initially, both Andrew and Joanne pleaded not guilty to the murder charges, but in a turn of events that shocked everyone in the courtroom, on December 5th, 2019, Joanne pleaded guilty to her charges. In her sentencing hearing, she asked for mercy, saying that she loved her son, but was disabled by drug addiction, as if she had no other options such as, I don't know, giving her son to the cousin who took good care of him. Her addiction and disability led her to beating AJ over the head with the shower faucet, hiding his body, and then pretending like she didn't know what happened. In the end, she was sentenced to 35 years behind bars for the murder of her five-year-old son. My heart, man. <laughs> My mind are consumed with despair, pain, sadness, grief, unceasing anguish, and extreme remorse. A tearful Joanne Cunningham spent eight minutes talking to the judge, facing up to 60 years in prison for admitting to killing her five-year-old son, A.J. Friend. Cunningham talked about her abuse as a child, indicating it led to her abuse of A.J. I love him. I miss him. There's nothing I wouldn't do to bring him back. More than a dozen witnesses testified in her hearing, including a forensic pathologist who examined AJ's body. Basically, his whole head um, is severely swollen, and there's bleeding throughout the scalp and soft tissues over the whole head. What did that tell you, doctor? That he had massive trauma to the head. The prosecution also showed pictures from inside the family's Crystal Lake home after AJ's dad reported him missing, clear warning signs of problems. One picture even showed a padlock on the outside of AJ's filthy bedroom to lock him inside. I will never be able to justify anything, nor do I ever want to. Through my negligence, my weaknesses and failures created a host of problems for me. After learning of the sentence, the rest of AJ's family were appalled by the audacity of Joanna saying that she didn't mean to do this, blaming her horrific behavior and violence on her addiction. Then 63-year-old Andrew Friend also came to a plea agreement. He pleaded guilty to charges of involuntary manslaughter, aggravated battery of a child, and concealment of a homicidal death. He technically was not the one who murdered little AJ, although he participated and stood by as it happened. So it seems like I guess these changes in charges are relatively appropriate for this he was sentenced to 30 years behind bars. After these two were sent to prison, a case was actually opened against the caseworkers in AJ's case. Specifically, 57-year-old Carlos Acosta, who was the one who saw the bruises on AJ, heard from the doctor that AJ said it was from being hit, yet determined that the allegations of abuse were unfounded. Now, it was said that Carlos, as well as the other caseworkers on AJ's case, did have caseloads far beyond what they were supposed to have according to Illinois law. But that is no excuse for literally seeing a child with a bruise, seeing the numerous other reports of bruising all over his body, being told that the bruises were caused from being hit, yet determining that no abuse was happening. That was just appalling. This case did go to trial, and in the opening statements, the prosecution said, quote, When your job is to protect children and you don't do that job because you are lazy and heartless, you are necessarily and by definition endangering children. They said that Carlos should have recognized the red flags, saying that blaming the family dog after AJ was literally prompted to say that, and the doctor determining that it wasn't caused by the dog, is just lazy and heartless. They said that if this case had gone to court, DCFS likely would have taken AJ out of their custody. They basically said that him closing the case like that prevented so many other adults from being able to help AJ. It was lazy, and it was because of this that AJ continued to be viciously abused, leading him to losing his life. Because of this, Carlos Acosta was charged with two counts of child endangerment and reckless conduct. This was actually the first time that child endangerment charges were successfully brought against a child welfare worker in the state of Illinois, and I can definitely see why. The prosecutor in this case said at the trial, quote, Unfortunately and fatally for AJ, he had two DCFS workers who couldn't have cared less. And after reviewing the information from the case and just how badly it had been mishandled, Carlos was found guilty of two counts of child endangerment, but not guilty on the charge of reckless conduct.
at the end of the day, this, uh, and I'm speaking right now to Mr. Acosta, is a refusal to investigate. I therefore find you guilty of neglecting and endangering the welfare of a child counts one and two. And so you were there, you were one of the people who inexplicably, I'd love to know the answer to this, I don't expect you to answer it, but I'd love to know the answer to how dad takes kids home from hospital where mom may or may not be overdosing and have unexplained injuries and somehow nobody bothers to go talk to the kids or Andrew or anybody else who could say, well, how often is mom, you know, she's got track marks up and down her arms. How long has that been going on? Uh, it's inexplicable to me. Um, and apparently you signed off on it. Um, and everything else that I've just discussed here, I, I don't understand it. I really don't. I have n no idea what in any way. You clearly weren't doing any critical thinking except to the ex extent that you said what will, for me, be an immortal statement in the, in the history of child care. Well, if that's what the kids said happened, as if that's definitively reliable. That's, and you did nothing else at all. Was there anything you wish to say? 57-year-old Carlos Acosta before Judge George Strickland at today's sentencing in Woodstock. I am not the lazy, uncaring monster that Patrick has portrayed me to be. He's working with abused children. Prosecutors asking the judge for jail time. Acosta, the late A.J. Friend's child advocate, found guilty in October of failing to protect the five-year-old from his abusive parents, both of them in the state penitentiary for their son's horrific murder. Not only did he fail to do his job, but he prevented others from doing theirs. Defense attorneys pushing back. The state's argument this morning, though, is inflammatory and designed to prey on the emotions of the court. There is very clear direction in the statute about what we are to do here. A day does not go by where I do not regret and feel remorse over the loss of AJ. It's inconceivable to me that this happened. Judge George Strickland says Acosta had substantial resources that he could have called upon from both the state and McHenry County if he hadn't willfully refused to investigate the matter. And while acknowledging how tough a job it is to be a DCFS investigator. There's no evidence that Mr. Acosta was overworked, um, that he didn't have time to investigate this case. It's uh, ordered by this court that the defendant shall immediately remand to the custody of the McHenry County Sheriff to serve a sentence of six months in the McHenry County Jail. Carlos's supervisor was also given the same charges, but it was found that it couldn't be determined with certainty how much the supervisor knew about the abuse, so the charges were dropped. However, the supervisor was fired from his position and he now works in a different field. So that is all of the information that I have on today's video. Obviously, this was such a horrific and tragic case. AJ was failed by so many people whose only job was to protect him. He had so many people in his life who loved him and would have cared for him and wanted to care for him. But instead, he was placed into the care of his mother and father, both of whom continued to exhibit concerning behaviors that showed that they were not fit to be parents. I do believe that when AJ was taken away, Joanne wanted to better herself and get clean. Same thing with Andrew. But once they both started slipping back into drugs, that should have been an indicator that she wasn't ready to be a mother. She easily could have visited her children if they were with her cousin if she truly cared about them, but she clearly didn't. One thing that really stands out to me is how everyone knew how violent and aggressive Joanna was when she was on drugs, yet when she was back on them and admitted to it and tested positive, no one thought that this aggression could turn towards her kids. She literally beat her husband and boyfriend when she was using, yet no one thought that this could be translated to the children. That is just ridiculous. Then, of course, the fact that AJ and his brother were both seen with numerous bruises on so many different occasions. They both lived in a disgusting, filthy, unlivable home. They had been reported to DCFS numerous times by concerned neighbors, yet some people said that the home was just fine. Some people said that the bruises weren't there. It's just, there's no continuity in the system. One person says one thing, another person says another, and it's just left undetermined. It's just left that these children are just 
fine. And so nothing is done. Obviously, that is a very frustrating and disheartening aspect to this case, but this might be the first case that I've ever looked into where the DCFS worker actually had to face charges for their negligence, and it's really nice to see. I am glad that this man is taking accountability for what he did because he did straight up just ignore the allegations and just wanted the case closed as fast as possible, ignoring everything that was glaring in his face, screaming at him that these kids are being abused. Because I do understand having an unmanageable caseload. I understand being overwhelmed at work. But when you are staring in the eyes of a bruised and battered child who just admitted to a doctor that they were being hit, who is probably terrified to even mention that to the doctor, it is a no-brainer. Do the bare minimum and keep that case open for further investigation. I get that they want to get these cases closed and off their caseload, but come on. He saw this little boy covered in bruises and then closed the case and went home and slept in his own bed safe and sound. It makes me wonder how often he worried about AJ, how he must have felt knowing that he just left a little boy in an abusive household. How did he feel after AJ was found dead. Either way, you all know I could go on a tangent about this for hours, but you all just spent about an hour listening to the horrific abuse AJ had to suffer, so that is where I'm going to end today's video. You heard my thoughts and now I want to know yours. Do you think that Joanna and Andrew really tried to get their life back together when they got AJ back or was it just for show? Do you think this could have been prevented? Do you agree with the charges against Carlos or do you think it's too harsh for an overwhelmed welfare worker? Let's discuss this and any other thoughts that you have in the comments below. If you liked this video, please make sure to go ahead and leave this video a thumbs up and subscribe to my channel. I put out new true crime and mystery videos every single week. Don't forget to turn that notification bell to on so you don't miss out on any of my future videos. Make sure you follow my Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, TikTok, and Spotify. All will be linked down below. And if you have any case suggestions, please make sure to fill out the Google form, which is also listed down below. With that, hope you guys have an amazing week. Stay safe, stay healthy, and I hope to see you next time. Bye.